Hey everyone, it's Siobhan, and welcome back for another edition of Game Programming Concepts, where today we're going to be diving into the implementations behind replay, undo, and rewind systems in various kinds of games, and when to choose which type of implementation and when not. So we're going to start by talking about an example. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. And let's say this game is called um, Space Spaniels, right? So I think Spaniels are a type of dog. Hopefully that's all they are, and I'm not embarrassing myself. Uh, and in this particular game, let's say that you play a dog, right? And it's like, a, you know, it's a cute little dog. And the dog is inside of a space suit, of course, because it's space spaniels, right? So here's this dog. So, ugh, didn't want that circle. That's okay, right? So the dog is in a space suit. Hooray. This is, this is, this is supposed to be a space suit, okay? Hooray, the dog's in a space suit. And um, this, these dogs, these spaniels, let's say you control a squad of these dogs, right? So in this game, you have, I don't know, like a squad of the dogs. So this is kind of like isometric kind of view. You got your little dog here, and then you got another dog here. They look just like dogs, don't they? Yay! And in this uh, game, they're kind of like exploring different space you know, objects, so you've got these different platforms they can kind of jump up on. So it's kind of like XCOM or like Mario Rabbids Kingdom, so there's like very specific like little kind of uh, tiles that they could potentially be on top of, and then they're going around, and let's say that they, you know, they're going around to try to defeat some kind of mysterious enemy, but there's no actual enemy, right? So they're actually just kind of exploring. You have like all sorts of weapon systems created and everything for the game, but there's no enemies. No, I'm kidding. Maybe they're actually enemies. Who knows? Or maybe their enemies are just their tail that they're chasing. I don't really care exactly how this game works, but let's say that you have your little squad of dogs. They're kind of, you know, advancing through the level and they have, uh, and they, they kind of are able to move to different tiles and perform different actions once they get to the different tiles. Maybe they aren't attacking, maybe they're just kind of like harvesting stuff that they're able to sniff through their spaceship or something like that, right? And um, the game designer said, and that game designer might be you, said, okay, I want in this game for you to be able to step back in time, right? So to be able to rewind um, so that if the player decided, oops, they went the wrong way, or there's a limited number of steps that they can take throughout the world, um, you know, kind of like Pikmin, where they have to like get back to their spaceship in a certain amount of time, they want to be able to rewind so that they can go out and get the different, you know, artifacts or things that they're trying to collect on the planet, and they want to rewind so because they made a mistake or something like that. So how would we be able to create a system like that? Well, we're going to start by just looking at an example of another kind of game that is played on a grid of different locations where a squad is able to move. And this uh, super advanced game is called Chess. Uh, and here, so this is Chess, and this right here is a example of a game. You know, bonus points if any of you can identify what game that is. But this is an actual game that has played in the history. And at this point, you might like pause the video and be like, oh my gosh, I think I know what we're going to do, okay? And then you might like leave the video or something like that. No, we have to unpack this because this isn't all that we're going to be doing, right? This is not the best solution for all different games. So it's really kind of important for us to understand what's going on here. So, but what this is, how it's represented, is apparently just a list of different player actions, right? So the first um, move has uh, the player moving perhaps the knight at an F3 position, right? I'm not a chess champ or something like that, but you can see that like as you go through here, it's essentially just a sequence of player actions. And so you're able to take this game and you're able to play it on like some chess.com or whatever kind of chess player and actually advance through all the moves and see exactly how that game played out. And using a similar system, you could essentially devise some kind of undo mechanism where you can kind of step back in those different actions. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by actions and what that means as far as game programming is concerned. Okay, so when we talk about an action in a game, you might think of it as like a... Uh, a method, right, or a function, right? So that you have a function, it's called, you know, move to square or something like that, right? So this is a function and um, 
any kind of object that can move to a square, whether it's a player character or a non-player character, um, they might have this particular action called move to square, and you're able to pass in something like the square ID or something like that, and it'll move that character to that square, supposing that they're able to move to that square. Okay, right, so this is a function, and then when you want to be able to use it, you produce a, a number of logic, you check to see if the player can move to those squares, and then they call the function by saying, you know, like, move to square, and then some kind of way of representing the, you know, square ID. We're going to use the chess example, right? So something like F3, right, this is what we saw before. So, right, this is what we would do as far as calling a function, but... With this particular um, strategy, we're not essentially calling functions, we're remembering functions themselves that were called in a sequence, right? And so basically what we want to do is we're not just calling functions, we're storing function calls, we're storing functions, right? We're not storing the state of the game necessarily, we're storing the actual inputs that the player was able to produce. Okay, so move to square F3, and so essentially a game like this, we can, essentially, we can remember the series of actions that the player has performed, and the game in this particular case is composed of what we would call entirely deterministic algorithms. So I want to say deterministic. What that means by each action being uh, deterministic, or the game essentially being composed of deterministic algorithms, means that if you were to imp if you were to um, apply the, these functions in order, it would produce exactly the same result reliably. So a de deterministic algorithm means that when you receive a particular input, it's always going to produce the exact same output reliably. And so if the whole game is deterministic, so it's kind of like that, I guess that kind of mini series called Devs. If you want to watch that on, uh, I don't even know, but um, check it out. <laughs> but the whole idea is that, this is a whole philosophy behind it, that if you, perf if you just remember the action, so instead of watching the game or remembering the game and all the different game states, instead if you just watch the player's controller, right? So you're not memorizing the game, you're memorizing the, the sequence of actions that the player has performed, that you can essentially rewind or you can replay the scenario exactly as it had done by essentially creating a simulation around it. You're just basically, like, the player is creating essentially an AI controller, an artificial controller that's producing exactly the same results, just being played back in the game itself under the same logic and the same simulation, and it's going to produce exactly the same result, right? And so that works great for this kind of game, right? And so how you would be able to implement it depends on the game engine, depends on the programming language, but, you know, if you're going to be using delegates or if you're going to be using something else, but essentially you're going to be saving a container of different player input actions in the form of uh, these types of these delegates where these methods themselves are, are essentially objects that you can store in a container. And this is actually called, for those of you who are interested, this is called the command uh, pattern the command programming pattern. The command pattern is where you take actions and you essentially t turn them into particular objects that you can do with what you want. So for example, the command pattern is often used in input systems because uh, instead of trying to like remember specific, like if the player presses the A button, this particular thing happens, instead you can essentially abstract that out to say that when the player performs this particular action, right, the jump action. And so you can remember the jump action as like an object, which you can then just pass around to different places in your game. And so that's very useful for being able to apply those actions to any type of object that is able to jump, right? So it's pretty cool. Um, and that's called the command pattern for those of you who are interested in knowing. Um, but, okay, so this works great for this kind of game because it's highly deterministic. The character can, the player can only move to very specific spaces, and the player performs very specific types of actions within those spaces, and the same, you know, results happen in the game, um, as long as, you know, you remember those actions in the correct order, in the correct sequence, and they can be played back as fast or slow as you want, and that, and that would work. However, let's say that the game designer has decided that Space Spaniels is, you know, 
could use some sprucing up, maybe something more interesting than this kind of like a XCOM with no actual like suspense or action other than like getting back to your spaceship on time. I guess collecting artifacts, so it's really turning more into Pikmin, Pikmin than it is to <laughs> XCOM. But let's say that the designer just kind of wakes up with this kind of epiphany that was not an eye roll, and um, that this game, okay, it's going to have the XCOM thing, you're able to move your character, uh, you know, a, around in this kind of tactical type of grid, but also what can happen is the player can hit a button called real-time mode, right? And so you have real-time mode saved as an object, right? So command pattern or something like that, and they press the, you know, R button on their controller, you know, the R key on their keyboard, and it goes into real-time mode where now there's like a whole physics simulation, and you dive into playing actually as one of these little spaniel characters. So suddenly all these lines become kind of like, you know, th there's no lines anymore, there's no grid anymore, so you're able to kind of fly your little your spaniel around. Hooray! Here's the little doggy good doggy right and the, this doggy is going wee flying in the air with a jetpack like go doggy um and is able to just kind of fly around and you know and you can and you fly around for like maybe 10 seconds at a time or something like that and then the other kinds of non-player characters are also like moving around and there's like physics involved so like there's gravity and you can kind of slide off of platforms and there's rocks that like tumble down and all that kind of stuff it'll draw little rocks that go like woo also fly around just just to add more you know difficulty to this whole situation and so the game designer says yeah i want to be able to do that um, and then wherever the player character ends up, it'll just kind of fudge them into like a, the nearest square or something like that so that it can go back into like tactical mode um, or something like that. Uh, and so the player, so the designer has decided, okay, well, actually, you know, I still want to have this rewind system, right? Um, and when it's in this real time mode, it like rewinds it, you know fluidly where you're able to like rewind just like five seconds and you're able to see all of the different actions that had occurred as you rewind over the previous five seconds or you can rewind 30 minutes by holding you know the button down and pressing like some other key in order to like increase the speed of the rewind so that you can rewind back in time and it's really cool um and then you're just like oh my gosh i just created this whole like chess you know container of all of these actions and you're telling me that now you want to create this <laughs> like real-time physics simulation thing it's like i can't do that what the heck do i do right so this is the kind of situation that you're in so this whole cool like storing a you know a sequence of undo a, a sequence of actions which you can easily undo or step back through some kind of you know controller that's able to hit a button and then it just like essentially um pops it off so like in this kind of undo system you might have like a stack right uh, the way that we have it here we have a stack of actions right you got these different when i say stack it's i mean the container uh, format where you're able to just like add an action to the top okay it's at the top of the stack and then when you hit undo the undo command it basically kills that action from the stack and it kills the next one it kills the next one and then it goes back to the actions before there so you add um from the top and then you remove from the top right so that's kind of how you could uh create some kind of system like this but oh my goodness this game now is going to have a real-time simulation at 60 frames per second with like a physics engine involved and so suddenly this whole deterministic thing is becoming a little bit more of a dubious type of uh of claim because like it, how could you possibly claim that this is going to be deterministic when like you've got two different uh two different l loops that are happening uh, simultaneously right you've got your update loop and your input and you've got a separate physics system potentially that's working on a different tick depending on the game engine but this is very common right where there's like a fixed loop and then there's this update loop and then when we're trying to rewind um if we're trying to create a replay system for example how are we going to be able to make sure that the exact synchronization of those loops are you know replay the exact same way that they had depending on the player uh, the player's, you know, system, it might replay at a different kind of, you know, rate, right? Because, like, the, there might be a slightly different frame rate. That's one kind of potential problem here. 
um, where when you try to re rewind uh, the, the different states, like the player controls, like let's say that we say, okay, well, uh, the player hit the A button or perform this particular action at this exact frame or at this exact moment in time, the player then hit this button at this particular moment in time, held this button for this moment in time. But when you're dealing with this kind of thing, you're, you're uh, especially physics engines involved, especially when there's randomization involved, um, you're going to really run into potential problems. Okay, there's going to be slight differences because of the synchronization of those loops, um, because the actual playback of the frame rate is not going to be exactly the same as it was when you had first done it. Um, also, you're going to run into, yeah, so, so I had mentioned random, you have to make sure that any kind of random type of uh, scenario, it's like some selection by random, has a reliable seed that produces the exact same random result the, the second time you know you're replaying it so you've got these types of problems so what do you do if you know you're not going to be able to just store a sequence of actions and feel confident that it's going to reliably play back exactly how it had played when you had um, first performed this you know sequence of actions Okay, and, and similarly then for a rewind system, that when you rewind these sequence of actions, that it's going to bring you back to the exact state you were before you had performed those actions. How can you, can you rely on that just by storing actions? Well, here's the thing. Like, you know, you, as you try to devise a plan, like you think the craziest idea is, well, what if I just remember the game state every single tick? Like, I remember all of the different things inside of the game. Six, I record the entire game state 60 frames like 60 times a second and create like some massive container of game states where I'm recording them every 60th of a second and I'm just rewinding back those game states. Is that like ludicrous? And the answer to that question is no, that's actually what we're going to, that's what you do, right? <laughs> that's what you can do. Okay, so um, how does that look, right? Actually, let's go this way. Ooh, oh, that's kind of fun. Like we, oh, it didn't do it the second time. There we go. So how, how can we then make that work? OK, so I understand potentially the problem where you're thinking like, oh, my God, I have to like remember the exact like position, the speed, the orientation of like all of the different rocks, all of the different particles, all of the different places in the game, like whether the player is winning or losing or, you know, the time state, you know, just every single part of the game. 60 times every second that sounds like a huge amount of memory that there's no way we're going to be able to encompass well there's a couple things that we have to remember there's a couple of things that are on our side first of all you don't have to save everything okay <laughs> that's that's kind of your important thing uh and two computers are real quick these days <laughs> OK, so I mean, to break it down, when I say you don't have to save everything, I'm talking about compression, right? Uh, well, I'm talking about specifically omitting things, but then the things you do keep, you can compress. And so among the things you do keep, let's say like 1B, you know, and the things you do save can be compressed. That's basically how we want to think of this. And computers are real quick these days. So um, a lot of the bottlenecks that we used to have in the past are just not really bottlenecks anymore. Uh, okay, as far as like computers remembering all this information and playing it back, uh, is just not as much of an issue as it used to be. So let's talk about this a little bit, about you don't have to save everything. So what do you have to save? So if we're going to be creating this kind of physics world where the spaniels are able to fly around and jump on things and you know collect objects and all this kind of stuff, what do you actually have to save? Well, you don't have, you really, you don't save anything that's static, right? So don't save anything that is static. And by static, I mean constant, right? Something that main, remains the same every single frame, right? You don't save that there is a uh, square at F3 every frame, or there's like a tree at you know a specific location every single frame. If the, the tree can't move, then don't worry about the tree. It's just part of the environment, and the environment is static, right? The different environmental variables that don't change are static and can uh, remain things you don't save, okay? This is similar to when we're talking about network programming. We don't send all the information about the game state. Um, to the different clients or the server because not all that matters uh, with respect to the state of the game. But then what about other things? So 
um, the player the player's position does matter, right? So when we um, think about the different things to save, we can say like each spaniel position, right? Spaniel position. That's something that we want to potentially save. And then also, like the sp spaniel might have a particular position, but was the pos was the spaniel moving? If the spaniel was not moving, um, it might have the same position as if the spaniel was moving. So perhaps we need to save the spaniel's velocity, right? So it's x, y, z velocity, um, and that's also this position, the x, y, z position, potentially are things that you want to be able to keep around so that when you rewind back these frames, and the frames themselves, like whether there were dropped frames or however many frames, it doesn't matter as much because we're still skipping back. So let's say like it moved twice as far a particular frame because the frame took twice as long because there's like, you know, a blip in the computer speed. It went from 60 frames per second to 30 frames per second. That's okay. We'll still jump back when we hit rewind and we'll just jump back twice as far for that particular frame. So we don't have to worry about the fact that some frames were like, you know, longer than other frames. Okay, so the spaniel's position, the spaniel's velocity is important. But what about like the spaniel's like acceleration? Is that important? Is the spaniel's acceleration important? Um, it depends, but let's say in this game there's a fixed gravity, right? So like, you know, the whole 9.8 meters per second squared kind of thing. So whatever the gravity is in this particular game, it's probably fixed. And so if it has a fixed gravity, then where whatever the velocity was of the spaniel at that particular moment, it's going to, as soon as you like hit stop rewinding, then it's going to continue to maintain that acceleration and kind of continue pulling that spaniel down at that same, you know, where, where it left off. So it's acceleration is constant. But in perhaps the drag, the air drag, you know, the damping of the the object as it's moving through air or, you know, the movement acceleration, if all of those numbers are essentially constant values inside of your objects, then you don't have to remember that information. So in fact, we can just go ahead and cross this out. I don't know how to do strike through in this particular application. So just right now, all we have to remember is the position and the velocity of the particular spaniel, but perhaps also like the player actions that they had performed, right? So you also want to remember like, what are the actions that they had performed in those particular frames, right? So you do want to remember like sp specific player actions in those particular frames. Um, Perhaps, maybe, maybe not. It depends on the game that you're trying to make. Um, but you're also gonna have to remember each of the spaniel positions and you're gonna have to remember each of the rocks positions and each of the rocks velocity. So you pot potentially you'll have some kind of controller that, or a manager that is um, keeping track of all of the different rewindable objects, right? Some kind of like rewind system of some kind. And, and it's keeping track of lists of these rewindable objects such that when you rewind, it's able to step back in time for each of those rewindable objects through kind of these sequence of lists. And so whether the rewindable is kind of a question about, you know, the, the, the structure of your interfaces in, in your particular system, it depends on your game engine, it depends on your language, right? But anyways, so um, yeah, and that's basically how you'd be able to perform this kind of, uh, this kind of system. But so you don't have to save everything, but also um, we're talking about compression, right? So if we actually jump back to the, um, the chess example, you can see that some of these actions like G3, like what, it, that sounds like a position. Where's like, what, what actual, you know, um, piece am I moving to G3? See, if there isn't a prefix for like what the, 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 the name of the piece is, then we can assume that potentially it's just a pawn because there, you know, are more pawns than any other uh, piece. So we can compress by saying if there is no prefix for the piece, then we'll just assume that it's a pawn moving that to those particular places. What is N, right? We've got like kings and uh, rooks and pawns and there's no, you know, piece that starts with an N. Well, a knight starts with an N. No, an N, a knight starts with a K, but king starts with a K. So here we're like, okay, well, we can save a character by saying N for knight, even though it's not spelled correctly, um, instead of KN. And that's also kind of confusing. Is there two pieces, like king and knight or something like that? So, th But the point is this is compression, right? So we're able to remember fewer characters. And now, of course, this doesn't matter, especially nowadays, because like a chess game, like I don't know how many plays you're going to, have and maybe you originally like are creating chess 
on like an incredibly limited system where you know you just have a few bytes to remember these types of games. But nowadays it doesn't really matter that much. But if you're re recording like 60 or 120 of these frames every single second, it might be useful to try to find a way to compress. And so how do we compress? Well, there's a number of different ways you can compress and it depends on the game. But for example, instead of recalling the position and the velocity every single tick, maybe you're only remembering the change in the position and the velocity every tick. Kind of like B-frames when you're talking about like MPEG recording, uh, MPEG compression, where if the previous frame for that particular pixel or whatever is exactly the same as the, 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 the next frame, then you don't have to remember that particular pixel for both frames. You just don't do anything for the next frame and it'll just assume that we're referring to the exact same pixel from the previous frame. Right, so this isn't like a class on video compression, but it's a similar kind of concept. So like if a player doesn't move at all or at the exact same position, the same velocity as the previous frame, perhaps you don't need to store any additional information, right? So you're not putting more junk inside of your containers until there is an actual change in motion and then you store that particular, you know, so, so maybe you're just storing like that this is this frame, this is this frame, this is this frame, but you're just not putting any new information in it because there's no, change in this position or velocity. So in that way, you're potentially going to be compressing your um, data. OK, so that's that's one thing to consider. But there's other things to consider because, you know, it's like, how am I going to ensure that this isn't going to blow out of proportion? Or maybe I'm storing, I'm creating a new object every single frame. I think I'm going to have problems with memory allocation and memory freeing and stuttering when I create the game. So that's where you can create something called like a pool. And that's something for a different concept lecture. But effectively, you're saying I'm going to allocate this much memory, right? I'm going to allocate 200 megabytes of memory for my re play system, my rewind system, and so I'm just creating all of the data structures, all of the memory right up at load time, and then instead of creating new objects every frame, all I'm doing is just changing values in those existing objects, and once it gets to essentially the end of a particular pool, um, depending on how you slice it all up, it'll just kind of go back to the beginning of the pool, <laughs> right? It's just overwrite what happened at the beginning of the pool. And so maybe after doing that and you, you know, surmise that it's going to have like 25 minutes of record time, you know, essentially. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of record time. Maybe I can reduce the amount of megabytes that I'm storing in memory for it. Or perhaps like you, you see, I hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say here, that with a pool system, you're able to um, not worry about stuttering because you do everything at load time and you don't actually unload any of that memory. So when you have your block of memory, all of these different states, you create all of these states, objects at load time so that every tick you're just changing, you know, the actual positions, you're, sorry, you're just changing values of the existing states and you're not unloading them from memory and you're not creating new ones from memory. It's just that once you get to the end of the particular pool, you just jump back around and overwrite what happened at the beginning of the pool. And so like maybe that was 25 minutes ago, so who cares? Right. So you can create some kind of advanced pool system that way to be able to also save on the problems that you would run into with uh, memory allocation. OK, so there's that kind of solution. Um, but even still, if you have a game that's like big enough um, or perhaps like you're trying to put this on a phone and you're afraid that the phone like, you know, some of people are running on devices that only have like two gigabytes of memory and only like, you know, a couple hundred megabytes of memory are even going to be able to be allocated for the particular game. Um, or maybe there, it's just so much stuff is going on in this particular game, right? There's like rocks everywhere, right? There's like hundreds of rocks and there's like, it's actually one of these kind of, uh, you know, uh, battle royale games where there's actually like a hundred squads all chasing the same thing and going back to their spaceships. You know, it's like Choo Choo Rocket, but with a hundred players. And it's like, oh my God, how this is going to start taking up way too much memory, right? If, if we're going to try to create a rewind, what if the game lasted for two hours? How are you going to remember that for a whole game? Well, you're, again, you're certainly not going to record a video of it, like an MPEG of it, because that's going to be astronomical in size. And also, it will entirely limit you to the very specific view of one particular player, right? You're not able to co do cool stuff and like change the angles and rewind at different speeds. And you, so you definitely want to actually create the rewind, the replay system yourself. But it's like, how are we going to remember all of those th different states? It's going to stack up to too much memory. Well, the final thing that you can consider doing is interpolation. 
Inter <laughs> There's just like text everywhere. Hopefully you're taking notes. All right, so interpolation. What do I mean by interpolation? Interpolation, I mean that instead of storing, so like let's say you have, again, your sequence of states. Um, and I don't know why they're so tall. I guess I'm thinking about rulers. All right, and here's the thing. Pianos, maybe? Um, <laughs> so at each of these, it's uh, it's not remembering every single frame. Like, this will be frame zero, and this will be perhaps something like frame 20, right? Or frame, yeah, let's say, yeah, like frame 20. And then this is frame 30, right? So instead of rec remembering every frame, you're instead remembering um, every, wait, 20, 30, Where, where's my math? Frame 40, right? <laughs> you're remembering like every third of a second. Um, and so by doing that, you're cutting down the amount of frames that are being remembered by an enormous amount, right? You're recording three frames every second instead of 60 frames every second. So, you know, you can do the math, but that's a lot less, like it's a 20th, the amount of memory that you were using before. Um, but okay cool but how does that work is it gonna be like super choppy in the in the replay right it'll be like uh, 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 when you're like actually watching the replay well no what you do is you interpolate the information in those frames interpolation so for example if in frame zero we say that the player's position was at zero boring but who cares but the point is then the player's position is at 50 and then the player's position is at 60 or something like that making it sound like it's all just kind of linear but who cares let's just say um, that that's just how position is being remembered uh, so what we do here is between frame 0 and frame 20 frame 0 or frame 1 frame 2 frame 3 frame 4 all the way frame 20 are essentially just a linear breakdown of all of the numbers between 0 and 50 across 20 frames. So that's some very basic arithmetic to be able to figure out how many you know, uh, actual units of position it's going to change every actual frame. And then frame 60, we're now going from 50, position 50 to position 60 over 20 frames. And so now frame 21, 22, 23, 24 are going to be moving um, a linear amount broken down between those last 20 frames. Um, and so, sure, like, if you look very carefully, it'll look like a little bit too smooth. It still will have that kind of like, uh, 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 but it'll kind of like have like a smooth motion between them. But if it's happening every third of a third of a second, it's very hard to kind of tell exactly like that that's happening. But if you look carefully at a lot of these games and their replays, you kind of can see that type of um, that type of thing happening. OK, so if there's like a first person perspective game where there's also aim involved, it's like, oh, my gosh, how are you going to deal with that? Well, the same kind of deal. Right. So if aim has to do with kind of the uh, orientation of the, the particular camera on that player, then it's not remembering that much information and you can still interpolate. Right. Like unless the player is like freaking out with their mouse, which they very well might be. And if they are. Like, that's where you can kind of see. Like, I, I challenge you to go into some replays of first-person perspective games and see if you see any kinds of interesting, um, you know, interesting kinds of um, dis discrepancies in how you remember moving the mouse in, like, like, a fast circle and how it actually replays, right? And so you might start see some of that interpolation where it's not able to, like keep up with that very specific circle if you're moving fast enough because it's just kind of interpolating between those frames right but most of usually it doesn't produce that much of a problem because it still remembers all of the different things that had happened like that this player was killed or this thing had happened and whether like the actual like aim doesn't like 100% match exactly how you remember it the outcome of that action is the same and usually it really isn't going to matter especially if you you know or saving every third of a second or something like that um, but then you got one last type of problem, and those are effects. So we have these player characters um, that move to these different locations, 
and you have um, you know rocks that are falling and stuff like that. But what about things like particle effects, right? So you, there's like an explosion, and that explosion has like some kind of cool little like streamers fly off into different directions. And the way that the designer had kind of intended it is that each of those kinds of particle explosions has like a slightly different kind of look to it, and it's because there's some kind of randomization happening in that particle simulation. It's like, oh my gosh, does that mean that I'm gonna have to record like the position and velocity of every single particle well you can try starting with that you know essentially implement the same kind of uh rewindable interface so that you can plug it into the rewind system without too much trouble again watch the other kinds of videos in this channel to talk about good code architecture to figure out how to create a really cool decoupled system to be able to do that, but test it out, see how it works. If it works, then it works, right? That's what matters. As long as it works on the, you know, the, the plat, the, uh, uh, the environment that you're trying to, to, to shoot for, you know, the, the test hardware, the, the production hardware, at the frame rate you want, then ultimately at that point it doesn't really matter. But you know, you might very quickly find out that no, it is taking up way too much memory. So in that case, it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to kind of break this down. And so for particles, there's randomization involved. You're gonna have to remember specific seeds so that it produces the exact same type of particle explosion with the same kind of colors and the same kind of stuff that happens so that it works out and it looks the same as it was, especially for a rewind system. Okay, for a rewind system, if you like do something, you see a big cool particle explosion, then you hold the rewind button and it like doesn't come back correctly. <laughs> and it's like, uh, what? <laughs> That's not, it, it would be very obvious um, that you would produce a problem. So for a particle type of system, for those types of effects, you have to think about it and you really have to just try a couple of things to see what works and what does not work. I know that's kind of like a cop out answer, but unfortunately, there, when it comes to things like these, Sometimes you do have to just try the most robust system first. Don't over-optimize right away. Don't over-engineer right away. Do the most robust thing first, which is to store every particle, its position and velocity, every frame. And so therefore, you can play it back exactly how it was, and you're gonna wind it back exactly how it was, and it looks amazing. If that doesn't run, like profile it, if it is taking too much memory, if it's taking too much CPU, then it would, probably wouldn't take up too much CPU. But the point is that it would, if it if it does if it's too slow, then kind of backtrack and and redecide how you want to do it. Don't like think right away like oh I need to like try to find a way to not have to restore this in memory. Okay, that's generally how it works. Try it out. If it's not, go further into your compression. Go f dive deeper into these other types of strategies. Uh, one last thing I think I had forgotten to mention is that this whole interpolation, it's like, oh, that sounds awesome. It sounds like, why don't we just do everything with that? Why don't we do our rewind system with interpolation? Well, the problem with the interpolation is if you're only saving every third of a second, we're coming back into the problem that we were talking about with physics systems and deterministic kind of behavior, where if you're remembering a specific position of a player um, like a third of a second ago, then it's possible that something has changed in that third of a second that would have a slightly different effect on how the, pl the player outcome after that third of a second. If it's a rewind system. If it's a replay system, sure, because it's just gonna play back the whole thing and it's gonna be the same, it's gonna be, the end outcome is gonna be exactly the same because you have it all recorded in this replay system. But if it's gonna be a rewind system, then players can come up with exploits with interpolation, right? They try to jump to a particular platform, they barely don't make it, they slide off, so they kind of like rewind and then they rewind and they rewind and they rewind and they rewind, in order to try to get like the very perfect, <laughs> you know, like velocity or momentum at that particular moment. And it'll like kind of fudge them forward just enough that they actually land on it if they do like enough kind of rewinds and things like that. And you can kind of fudge through things with that type of interpolation. So when we're dealing with kinds of like really particular gameplay that has to do with hard, hard to be considered deterministic types of outcomes, then interpolation is probably not going to be robust enough for a rewind system. Okay, try it out, see what happens. Okay, well that's all I have today. If you like this video, please like it. Um, subscribe if you want to see more content like this. You can, you know, leave a comment, say what kind of videos you want to see or what other types of things you want to talk about. And until next time, you have a great day and uh, wishing you peace.